So, um, but what I'd like to do is I kind of want to start by talking um, about why am I the one that's talking about this issue here. Um, I'm an academic facilitator, one of two. And um, basically, the, uh, the reason why I, uh, let me go back to this page here. My, my background with this is actually more on the personal side, not necessarily through Teasley and through work. Um, probably around 11 or in 2001, my mother-in-law founded an organization called Wellspring Living. And what this organization does is um, it works with survivors of human trafficking in the Atlanta area. And through this, through this organization, she's, um, she's gathered a great team around her of people who are experts in childhood trauma, therapists, um, lots of different people who have, who have experience with trauma in different ways. And um, so she founded that. So that's kind of something in the family. My husband worked for that organization for about five years. He did donor development. But part of his job was he went around and, and spoke on the issue, giving statistics, kind of talking about what they do in their program. So being married to him, I went. And I got to learn a lot. And um, you know, we'd be at booths. We'd have a booth set up, and we would talk. And he would be the speaker. And then I would kind of answer questions and stuff like that. Um, and so that's kind of where some of my interest in this came, because um, even though they were working with with ladies, uh, with girls actually ages 12 to 18, and then with um, women older who have been survivors of human trafficking, all of them had a prior history of childhood sexual abuse. So trauma was a big deal in how the program worked with them. Um, so we did that, and then through this organization, um, I was asked to be a consultant on something called the Thrive Center. And this was basically Wellspring's idea of developing a trauma-informed school for these girls because in an educational environment, I mean, they would run away. They would, it just, things would just trigger them. It was not a good place for them to be mainstreamed into a public school. So they wanted to develop something where they could go to um, that would basically have an understanding of trauma-informed practices. So I was paired with their lead therapist and um, we worked together to design this school and I just spoke into the educational side of it and uh, she spoke into the therapeutic side of it. But through these conversations and through this dialogue, I was able to learn a lot about what are some best practices for working with children who've been through trauma in an educational setting. I learned a, a ton from her just asking questions. Um, that school, right now, they're, they're raising funding to get it set up so it's an established place. Um, and then through Wellspring also, um, they asked me to help hire their teacher that works one-on-one -on -one with the girls. And so through that, they sent me to something called uh, strength-based training which is a training that works really well with kids who've been through trauma. So some of what I want to bring in today comes from that strength-based training. And, uh, and then finally, um, through this organization again, they, uh, they wrote a book that was called The White Umbrella. And they asked different people to contribute to the book. And so they asked me to write a chapter in this book. And my chapter is basically on people who work with kids and students who've been through trauma, like if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a, um, a teacher, if you are in the caring profession at all, what are some things that you need to know? And specifically, some doing, uh, talking about the research of what trauma does to the brain. So I spent months and months really researching to prepare to write and publish this chapter. And a lot of what I'm going to share with you today comes from that research. Um, again, I'm just academic facilitator. At the time, I was an eighth grade middle school teacher, you know. But um, if you're if you're curious as to where this information is coming from, I just this binder is full of, um, of of journal articles and things like that. That is the background behind the research of what I'm sharing. Um, the book was published in 2012, and then some of the other research I'm going to be citing today is. Uh, from these sources here, and I forgot my visible learning by John Hattie, but there's some Hattie in there as well. So these are some really great um, resources if you're interested in looking further as to how to work with these kids. And that's kind of like why I'm here talking about it, you know. So that's the background I have. Um, I want to start with Teasley. And what kind of got me interested in looking at trauma and Teasley is I attended a session with Dr. Lester on um, the discipline numbers for our county. And what they were kind of challenging principals to do was to take a look at the demographics of who's, who's receiving consequences. 
and um, talking about are there different ways for how you can address different um, issues in the classroom other than just an office referral. So what I wanted to look at was, and again, uh, the first time I gave this presentation was in December, so I just have a snapshot of August through October. But what I wanted to look at were what's going on here as far as this. So um, this basically is an overview of the consequences that were given out at Teasley between August and October last year and August and October this year. And as you can see at the time, this year, more kids were getting, getting ISS, um, all of these different like write-up consequences this year than last year. So we've had an increase. And this is on your handout if you want to see it up close. There was an increase in Saturday school. So last year at that time there was nine um, Saturday school referrals, and this time there was 15. Um, also, you could see that uh, OSS and ISS were greatly increased. So there's been an issue of escalating behavior resulting in some of these more severe consequences. So that's telling me, like, okay, we're trending where we're, we're still having an issue here at Teasley. Um, this I find really interesting, and you can look at this. It's on the other side of that page with the colored chart. So what I think is interesting about this is these are the actual incidents that are cited on office referrals that are sent to um, the assistant principals. And I didn't know, like, when, when a referral goes in, it's basically coded with, like, a, like, it might say 6C or 4A or something like that. I didn't know as a class, as a teacher, anything. Apparently those codes correlate with the handbook. And so what I did is you could pull a report on Aspen on the codes, and I kind of... Went, I went to admin and said, will you tell me what these codes actually mean? What's interesting is this is all of the office referral codes from last year, the entire school year. And last year, you could see the ones uh, towards the bottom. We have um, willful refusal to comply and minor disturbance have by far the highest number of office referrals. Um, and if you look over here, what was trending in August through October, you're seeing the same thing. You see willful refusal right here, and you see minor disturbance. Now, we do have horseplay as the highest, and one of our administrators said that uh, that skewed the data a little bit because at the beginning of the year they were, like, doing referrals on every kid that skipped class, like every kid that was late for a while to try to, like, nip it in the bud. But what I think is interesting is we're trending with those same things over and over. So... Um, as far as the codes go, when I was talking to admin to try and understand them a little bit better, what they told me was these codes right here, the willful refusal and the um, minor disturbance, those are all classroom-based issues versus, like, a kid getting in a fight or a kid bringing vodka to school. You know what I mean? Like, the things, usually these are things that escalate within a classroom. So that's kind of telling me that... Um, the things that uh, we're writing up as a, as a school are things that we might want to look at what's going on in the classroom to try and de-escalate some behavior. And you guys, you guys have seen this. I mean, you know what we're talking about. You know the kids that we're dealing with. So, um, and it would be good to equip the staff with better strategies to know what to do. This I also found super interesting. So I wanted to disaggregate, disaggregate the data by looking at some subgroups who perhaps may have gone through some trauma. And I'm going to go through some statistics on what percentage of our population may have been through trauma. But what I looked at was I pulled all of our special ed population. And I'll explain why I pulled special ed in a minute, because you wouldn't think, like, well, you can't just assume. Um, I pulled any of our students who live at the Angel House address. I pulled any of our students who live at the Goshen Valley address, and I pulled any of our students who currently reside at the Family Violence Center address. Doesn't mean they've all been through trauma, but we do know that if they're at those three places, it's highly likely that something's going on that's impacting them. And then I looked at those kids, and I looked at, I, I was able to pull a report where I could see the, um, the incident, each individual incident and who the child was. And when you're looking at... Well, I pulled two reports. So one was each individual incident and what child. The other was um, per child and how many write-ups they've had. Does that make sense? There's like the two different ones. So in one of the reports, the number of write-up incidents, meaning not by child. So like one child could count seven times 
versus counting one time. The number of incidents, 36% of our incidents were from students who are within that population. When you look at what individual students are getting write-ups, 25% of them were in that population. But what's interesting is the actual number that our school has that are students with um, disabilities or live at those group homes at the time was around 19%. So there was a disproportionate amount. We're getting more from our kids from those subgroups, which is telling me, like, you know, something's going on with these kids. Perhaps there may be a correlation between what they've been through and how they're presenting in the classroom. So um, I don't know, data doesn't interest everybody, but I think it builds a case for why it's even important to look at trauma. Um, so here's some bigger statistics. So in, by 2007, and notice how old that data is. This, what I'm reading to you comes from this book, Trauma Sensitive Schools. One fourth of public high school students were suspended at least once. The reasons why they were suspended, 5% were for weapons and drugs, but 95% were for disruptive behavior and other. So again, that's a school-based disturbance versus bringing something, you know, something we can't really control. The cost to society per dropout over their lifetime, which includes the cost for police, the court system, prisons, the loss of income and, income and taxes, is $292,000 per kid that drops out. Um, over 1 million kids are diagnosed with mental illness or disability that could be better explained by trauma. And this is why I brought in our special ed population, because sometimes what we're seeing through the special ed students is the, um, and you'll see this in the research I'm going to share, what's presenting as a learning difficulty in the classroom really is, or especially in emotional behavior, something going on emotionally, it, it's real, but it may have, it may come from an onset of trauma that happened when they were younger, particularly if that child went through trauma at a young age. So that's why I wanted to include special ed. And then at any given time, approximately 40% of the student population may have trauma histories. And this is just a, this is a generalized number. This doesn't mean like, well, our school has more, this school may not. At any given time, and, my, and you guys know my background, I worked at Creekland for a while. And a lot of the stories that I'm sharing with you today actually come from my time at Creekland, which is not Title I. We think of it as more of an affluent school. But at any given time, 40% of the population. So this, um, when we're defining trauma, I think if I were to ask everybody in the room, what do you think trauma is, we'd all have a different definition of it. We'd all have uh, something in our mind that we associate with trauma. So the CDC actually did something called an ACE study where they studied what makes up trauma. And what they found is that these things right here can cause trauma. I'm going to emphasize can because we're going to, I want to go deeper in this. Um, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Physical and emotional neglect. And then in the home, if there's someone in the home who has a mental illness, someone in the home who's incarcerated, um, if the child sees a mother treated violently, if there's substance abuse in the home, or if the child has been through divorce. And um, I do want to point out that with these different things here, most of these are taking place in the home. Um, a lot of these abuse and neglect, I mean, even a lot of these, it's perpetrated by parents or primary caregivers. Um, and a lot of times, some of these things are often unseen or unrecognized by anyone outside of the home. I do want to point out, though, because I'm, I'm sensitive to the room, some of you are probably like, well, I've been through these things, and I'm not traumatized, or my kid went through this, and my kid's not traumatized. You're probably right. What this, what this study also says is it's not necessarily something like divorce that makes you traumatized. It's actually your ability to cope. So if the child is in a situation where they don't have the caring environment where they can cope, that is when it becomes traumatic. So there's a big difference because, I mean, we have a lot of kids who've been through these things, and they're fine. A lot of us have been through these things, and we're fine. But that's because we've had the support system to cope with it. That's huge. Um, so you want to ask, 
does the event exceed a person's capacity to cope? And is there an absence or, or are there limited resources available for the child to cope with what's going on? And I do want to park real fast on sexual abuse. Um, again, through my work with Wellspring, this is where we kind of, where we dug in a little bit because most of those women and most of those girls have had a history of prior sexual abuse. Um, one in three, you know, we saw this in our safe schools training, but one out of three girls are, will be sexually abused before they turn 18. The statistic is one out of four boys. Um, the average age of sexual abuse, it, the majority of it happens between ages 7 and 13. So if it's going to happen, it's the group of kids we, we're working with. It already has or it's happening for the first time. Um, this is what gets me. There is nothing that makes a child more likely to be sexually abused. There's no type of, oh, well, if they're from poverty, or oh, if they're from this um, race, or if the, oh, if they're from this socioeconomic status. Sexual abuse happens across all types of levels and all types of kids. Um, usually it's a friend or a relative. And so when it comes to this exceeding a person's capacity to cope, we have a lot of, like, a lot of this may happen in poverty kind of situations, but sexual abuse really does impact the brain and really, like, these, um, what we're going to see about pre how it presents in the classroom, we'll see this a lot from kids who aren't from poverty and aren't from some of these uh, things that might exacerbate the, a, the a child's ACE score because sexual abuse is not often shared. It happens all across demographics, but it's not something that these kids bring forth. So as far as even if they're in a loving home, and even if they have the resources available, if they're not sharing, then it has exceeded their capacity to cope. Therefore, it has become traumatic. Does that difference make sense? Um, yeah. So um, anyway, that's how when we're defining trauma moving forward, I want to define it this way. So as far as what does trauma do to the brain, uh, the, the brain, when it forms, it forms from the bottom to the top. And um, the first thing that forms in the brain is basic regulatory functions. So things like um, telling the heart to beat, telling the body to breathe, those things are formed at the very, very youngest stages. Um, Complex functioning and understanding and reasoning form layers. And it's kind of like everything that forms in the brain is a foundation, and then something else comes on top of that, and then there's a foundation, and a different foundation. So everything is based on what was formed before. Um, so this is what's huge. A traumatic event that happens at any point in development changes the way the rest of the brain continues to grow. What I saw over and over in the research that surprised me was the younger the child is when the trauma happens, the more it impacts them. So if you've got a kid who's two, who's three, something happens as a baby, there's so many things that are formed after that point that are going to be impacted by that traumatic event. Um, and the reason why it impacts is because the brain is malleable. So the, the, what will happen is the brain will actually make early accommodations to deal with the searing that happens in the brain from trauma. So that's why everything afterwards is impacted by the event, the, that, that first onset of trauma that happens. Um, so this means the neural networks that are responsible for memory, problem solving, learning, motivation, information processing, and distress tolerance those things that develop later in life, those things are severely impacted when trauma happens. Um, and again, uh, I think I mentioned this, but when, if you were to look at a brain that's been through trauma, there's literally like a searing that happens in the brain. So what happens is, you know, we know that the brain is divided up into right and left hemispheres. And so... <coughs> The ACE study said that when a kid goes through trauma, a traumatic event to a child, is the, it, it manifests the same way and it impacts the brain in the same way that a life-threatening situation would on an adult. As far as the alarms that go up and, um, and like the residual um, after effects of going through something life-threatening as an adult, 
one of those tra traumatic events without the ability to cope can impact the brain in that same exact way. So trauma, when, when a child has been through trauma, it activates memories on the right hemisphere, but it deactivates executive functioning on the left. That's really important. So the synapses where the right brain talks to the left brain and back and forth aren't happening because, like I said, there's like a searing in the brain. And so um, a lot of times children who've been through trauma are often not able to articulate things because you have to use both sides of the brain. If you have a memory, you have to use, that's, in your, that's stored in your right brain, you have to use your left brain to put it into words and to be able to talk about it and be able to like put sentences to words. You're feeling all the feelings and all the emotions and that memory is definitely there, but you can't articulate. Um, so, and that's, that's with any, it's not just about the traumatic event. If you ask a child, why'd you do that? And that child is like, can't answer you on the spot. A lot of times it's like here, but they just like, can't make sentences, can't tell you. Um, what's sad about this is the survivor of trauma is often haunted by an unnarrated past. The memories are there, but there's no narration to it in the brain. They can't talk it out. Um, what they do with the girls in the Wellspring program is they actually do a therapy called EMDR. And what this therapy does, you know, you know it, is it, um, it connects both sides of the brain. So they'll, they'll be sitting with a therapist and like, if, I, if I'm understanding it right, like the therapist will touch one leg and ask a question, or it's whatever leg would be the left brain. So the right leg is connected to the left brain. But they'll touch the leg that's connected to the side of the brain to activate it so that when the child is talking, the, uh, the child, the synapses are happening so they can put things into words. That's why, like, I always say, like, my husband and I, when we go for a walk, that's when we have our deepest conversations because we're activating both sides of the brain, you know. Our, the actual movement is causing both sides of the brain to talk. That's why art therapy is so invaluable because, you know, they're able to draw and things like that, and that kind of connects to the other side of the brain to talk about memories. Um, so that's interesting. Um, the thing that's huge is they've seen this in Wellspring, and they've seen, and uh, we've seen this with our students, especially our middle school students. Is a lot of times when trauma happens, the child, the teenager, the adult later in life is still functioning kind of emotionally at the age they were when the trauma happened. So that's why we'll see, like, I'm thinking of conversations with eighth grade students where they're making just a, and I'm not talking like all middle schoolers kind of do dumb things, but like where you're, you're talking to this girl and they're dating someone that's 19 or, eight, you know, 18 and they're in eighth grade and they're describing this person. I'm thinking of a student right now. And you're just like, do you not see the warning signs? Are you not assessing that this is, this is not good for you? This is dangerous? No, they're not. Because they're, they're functioning based on, on when something traumatic happened a lot of times. Um, this is an awful story, but my husband one time was sitting on a panel at Emory University, and it was a human trafficking panel. So he was kind of the, ex, the person on, who was the expert on restorative care. But on the panel with him was um, actually a former pimp. And so they were asking him, they said, and of course he, he doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> and so they were asking him, tell me what you did to lure these young girls to, to do what they do for you. And he said what he would do is he would go to the mall. And he would, um, when he saw a young girl, he would, do you mind if, I'm not sure what just happened there. <laughs> but what he would do is he would, um, say to them, you have beautiful eyes. And he would just say that over and over, but it was the girl that needed to hear it is the one that he was able to kind of turn. And uh, she just wasn't assessing. Like, some, like most girls would just be like, ugh, or ignore. But the girl that was like, thank you, oh my gosh. And like he was able to strike up a conversation and the stranger danger wasn't going off in her head. And then later when he said, you know, I'll buy you all these nice things and if you'll do these things for me, I'll, I'll love you, I'll be your boyfriend, but she's not seeing the abuse that's happening. There, she's not assessing risk kind of thing. And a lot of that comes from um, that the, they don't assess risk. Uh, they assess risk at the level where they were traumatized. 
um, I want to talk about a sense of normalcy and assessing risk with trauma. And you'll see this come up on the slide in just a minute or right now. Um, so normally, the environment gives cues to the child as to what's normal. When a child um, has, has been through trauma, they have a different definition of what is considered normal and what is considered safe. That definition is based on what they've been through. So again, when abuse happens, all parts of the brain are accessed because it's responding to a threat. So the whole brain is like on hyperdrive, right? And um, after the event is over, the brain resets. And when the brain resets, it's learning, OK, now I have another definition of what is normal for me. So for kids who are going through continual trauma, normal is often that state of hyper arousal that you feel when you're really scared. That is a normalcy versus, oh, that only happens when I'm scared. Well, if you've been through it enough, your brain tells you this is what I should feel all the time. I should always be in a state of hyper arousal, hyper, hyper vigilance to protect myself from danger. This is really big when it comes to escalating behaviors in the classroom, why it can happen like that. Um, so uh, again, all future experiences are processed and interpreted based on that new template of what's normal. The brain isn't sending warning messages anymore like a healthy brain would when in danger, hence my, those girls at the mall who are not making good decisions. Um, the body no. this is interesting. The body no longer, go, no longer knows how to go back down to a state of calmness and peace. Again, that's why in the classroom they can blow up quickly because they were not at a state of calm or peace at all. Their normalcy state is a state of like just self-protection. Um, and normal for them is assessing threats all the time. So anything that is closely, like, that's per being perceived as a threat is considered a threat, even if it's not. Um, anything that reminds them of a traumatic event can cause them to go right back into that situation and be re-traumatized again in the middle of what's going on in your class. And I have a good example of this. I did a writing, uh, creative writing workshop with some of the girls in the Wellspring program over the summer, like one day. And I did, one of my favorite activities is I have like this thing of seashells, and I bring in the seashells, and I'm like, pick a shell. <laughs> write about the shell, you know, describe the shell, you know. And then we talk about, like, how are you like your shell? And we look at the crevices, we look at the cracks, we look at the color. Um, they're real shell shells from the ocean, so they're weathered and stuff like that. And when I asked that question, one of the girls, she just had to leave. I don't know why she had to leave. She had to just go and talk to her therapist and be out for a minute. But she welled up with tears when I asked her, how are you like your shell? Because something about that question brought her back to, that, to some moment, and she remembered something, and she, was, she couldn't do anything else for me at all. And it was just as simple as a writing prompt. So I'm not talking about like when you're angry in class. I'm talking it could be anything. And we can't control it. So it's more like being aware that that might be what's going on with a kid that's disassociating. So what can be a trigger? Um, the sight of a person who reminds them of their perpetrator, even if you're nice and you're not even like them at all. Um, a tone of voice could bring them right back to that moment. A seemingly safe situation that brings up prior memories can do it, a wandering mind that goes back to what happened in their past. That's why it's really important, like here, to keep kids engaged the whole time versus like having a lot of dead or downtime because really, a wandering mind could bring them back to a place they shouldn't be. Um, a generalized reminder of past trauma. Uh, that's maybe the seashell thing, who knows? Could have been a, real, a reminder of something real. Body posture, like standing over, like standing over like this versus getting down on their level and talking this way, right? Um, or it could even be like the way that your face is looking at them, your, the posture of your hands or anything like that could bring them right back in your choice of words. If you're saying something that they heard in the past that reminds them of that event, that will bring them right back to it. And why? Again, it's because a survivor of abuse is in a constant state of sensitivity to threat, and they can jump from being somewhat apprehensive to in a state of sheer fear 
in the seconds because their body has trained them to do that. And with fear comes the response, fight, flight, or disassociate. So it's not just they're afraid. They're doing their, they're doing their defense mechanism. Um, and that brings me to what do they do? So um, boys and girls, actually, and this is, I'm speaking in generalities, but they will manifest trauma. They'll present trauma like uh, differently than each other, typically. So a boy is a lot of times easier to spot. He's caught in elementary school. They're able to identify things earlier because usually their response to being re-traumatized is fight or flight. So that means that they are um, clashing with authority. They're fighting with you verbally or physically. Um, they are often troublemakers, fighters. They're hyperactive. Hyperactivity can be something. Um, because it's, this is usually manifested outwardly, unfortunately, uh, the ratio for boys getting help versus girls is three to one. So typically, more boys, they're able to figure out they've been through trauma than there are girls. For girls, they are a lot of times not caught till later because their typical response, and this is not, again, this is in generalities, but their typical response is disassociation. And what disassociation means is it means um, going to another place in their mind, just something where they're just not even, they're not even there anymore. Sometimes it really is, like living in a fantasy world or daydreaming or taking on a different persona. That's a way to dissociate. So um, they are more likely to dissociate than boys. And unfortunately, the way that uh, sometimes that they dissociate is through self-soothing behaviors like cutting. And that's, we see a lot of that in middle school. That's a lot of times a dissociative response. Um, it's a way to, uh, it's, it's just, just a self-soothing way to cope a lot of times. So um, we'll see this in girls that will just completely shut down, and it's like they're not, they're not in there with you. Like they're just done. And they won't tell you why they're done because, again, left brain, right brain, they can't put it into words. They're just done. Any questions so far? I've kind of like fire-hosed information before. I'm going to tell you what to do, like to help. <laughs> I promise. I just think it's important to have awareness first. Um, yes? Like as far as repeated kids? Or is it like your specific yeah. and um, how do you know where to defend it in there? How many times do it go there? <coughs> yes, there's actually a report in Aspen that tells you within this time period how many times did Joe have a referral? And then you can look at what were those referrals. Was it all willful refusal? You can see that. I, I just learned how to see it in Aspen. I don't know if, it, if teachers can see it. I wish they could. I don't think they can. But I know I have a little bit of administrative rights. That does exist. And I think that data would be really interesting, especially if you're looking at a particular child and trying to track what's going on with them. But that's also why I'm a big advocate for our electronic discipline, because sometimes you can pull the discipline infractions that happen before it hits referral, and you can look at those trends. Um, whenever we do a student shadow, I'm always looking at discipline trends first that, that come from the point system. So you can look at that in their agenda or things like that, too, and then see, okay, how does that manifest when it escalates? But yeah, we can pull that. Was there a question over here? No, I thought so. Okay, any others? Yes, oh yeah, you had several. I don't know. Now, when I'm using the word hyper, I'm not talking, I know I said hyperactive here, but when I say hyper arousal, I mean like increased, like hyper vigilant, like, like the way we use hyper, like increased and more versus, well, I guess that's what hyperactive means, versus like hyperactivity, like they're hyper all the time. It just means they're, 
I'm meaning that their their mind is there way more often than than others. But I I do know um, Bruce Perry. One of his articles talked about a little bit about how a when it when it was talking about. I can show you the article where I looked at where it talks about boys and girls. He does mention it, but of course we can't say that that's always what what's going on. But he does mention it as it does present itself that way sometimes. So. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to keep moving. We good? Okay. So how does it impact learning? Obviously, if the brain is, whenever trauma happens, anything formed after that is impacted. So a lot of those learning things happen later in life, especially um, if you look at the um, stages of development and things like that. So traumatized children, this is almost obvious, have lower test scores on standardized tests. Um, the altered architecture of their brain threatens their ability to achieve academic and social competence. Early trauma limits the child's ability to use higher order thinking to regulate subcortical brain activity. We're trying to push for higher order thinking all the time. There's some, there's some physical things going on as to why they may not be able to get there. Uh, this is huge. Their thinking is held hostage by relentless fear and hyperarousal. I mean, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, that's the second tier of his triangle, safety and belonging. If your mind is focused on surviving, your mind is not focused on math. So their thinking is occupied by something else. Um, and that's what the next thing says. Their attention is directed towards survival and defending themselves against reoccurring trauma symptoms instead of integrating new information. And they may easily give up in the face of challenging tasks. So with language in particular, this, this fascinates me because we do PSYOP, you know, and we're always targeting language acquisition. And, and, you know, academic language is a second language to all of our learners. But um, early trauma definitely threatens all aspects of language development. Um, the part of it is usually in a traumatic situation with, the, that, with that ACE, those ACE fields, where it's happening in a crisis home, maybe not necessarily sexual abuse where it's in a loving home, but they just never tell. But um, because there's not a consistency in caregiving relationships a lot of times, that reduces their, the ability of the child to use self-talk to monitor their behavior. So they just act, and there's no skill set of self-talk to talk themselves down, to, to walk themselves through how do I respond. Um, their ability to anticipate what comes next in everyday routines is not there. Because if they're living in a crisis home, there's no such thing as an everyday routine. So whereas we would say, oh my gosh, I have it written on the board every day. Like every day this week I have said it's due. We do the same thing every day. We get out our weird book and we do our silent sustained reading every day. Well, you know what? That's a routine. But routine isn't something they're used to. So it's frustrating as a teacher. These kids aren't all the time responding to routine because routine is not part of their world. Um, and the ability to use images and words to think about the internal and external world is difficult. And that I, there's mostly writing teachers in here. So I'm... I'm reading and writing. So I'm thinking through when we ask them to be creative, like, oh, you know, find an image that represents or something like that. That connection is hard. They often lack the language they need to explain what's going on emotionally. Because they're in that state of heightened arousal, it's difficult for them to express themselves or you just use language in problem solving. That's why things like turn and talk, where they're able to hear someone else express themselves, talking through a situation, those PSYOP strategies are so big because you're he that child is able to hear what it sounds like. Um, they may remain speech, oh, this is, this is important. Even when they have age-appropriate vocabulary at their command, they still may not be able to express themselves when it comes to problem solving. Uh, they may remain speechless when asked for information or a justification for their behavior. And there is a huge deep-seated distress of adults, because a lot of times trauma happens because of an adult. So cup, that distrust, distrust of an adult plus that hyper arousal, like constantly in that fight or flight state, um, causes a lot of things to be perceived as dangers and threats to them, and it seriously compromises their ability to learn. I mean, it could be what a kid says next to them. Um, all of those things impact language and learning. 
So here's some warning signs to look for. Poor self-regulation. A lot of that has to do with there's no self-talk going on. The propensity toward apparently unprovoked aggressive behavior. A pervasive mistrust of authority. Hypersensitivity to danger that limits motivation and ability to learn. For example, if they think they're going to fail in front of a large group of people, well then they're going to self-protect and not do something. They'd rather not do it than to do it and um, cause something that happens, you know, kids making fun or whatever, show failure. They, uh, tuning out, uh, sorry, no apparent interest in school. Tuning out, falling asleep in class, or isolating themselves could be some signs. Um, somatic problems such as headaches or stomach aches in response to fearful and helpless situations. So when there's a big test coming up and they all of a sudden have to go to the nurse, that is, that could be a sign. This one's, this one is very interesting to me. Compulsive repetition, the need to engage authority figures in reenactments of their past traumatic exchanges with caregivers. I feel like I, I don't know, but I'm th there's a situation I experienced um, here at Teasley as an eighth grade teacher. There was a kid, for some reason, he hated me. Like, it got to the point he would refuse to walk in my room, you know. We got, we had, we tried to do, like, we're a family and all this type of stuff. And we're, this is our culture. Everybody's welcome. And it, I felt like I tried everything I knew to do. And then at one point we were talking, and uh, he, was, he was so upset that he finally said, I thought you said we were going to be a family. And I just, like, for a minute I was like, whoa, we're having a different conversation. Like, this has moved from classroom-based to you're, you're talking to me as if I'm someone else. And I do know, um, I, do, I don't know if this kid was traumatized, and I don't want to assume that about a child, uh, but I do know that he had, he had just been through a really, really bad divorce, and he was living with dad and mom. There was something wrong, something up with mom. So I wondered if he was talking to me as if I was his mom. But that's what I mean. Like, if that really was the case, he's reenacting a traumatic situation, something that was traumatic. We'll see that with sexualized behaviors as well. Um, you'll see um, hurt people hurt people. A lot of times abusers are people who were abused. So that reenactment um, comes up that way. And that's kind of what this is saying here. Emotional warning signs, resisting adult engagement in ways that seem sullen and remote, like completely not wanting to talk to you or anything. That could be one way. Or the exact opposite, being super clingy. Again, stranger danger or like those warning signs like this is not okay. Um, it, could come, it could go either way. Being overly empathetic as if a trying to alleviate their own pain by being overly solicitous of others. So if you, I, I just remember from a few years ago, we had a whole group of girls from Angel House. And every time they got in trouble, it wasn't because they were fighting this person. It was because they were defending this person who was in a conflict with this person. So it was always like taking up for someone else. There was a lot of like loyalty stuff, like I got your back kind of thing. You don't say this about my friend. So um, I find that interesting. Struggling to interpret the thoughts and feelings of others, being socially inept. Sometimes it could even look like Asperger's type where they're, where they're just missing social cues. Like you should know not to do that. That's a social cue. Um, misinterpreting body language and facial cues, attributing negative intent to benign feedback from others, like completely reading into it negatively, having difficulty with spontaneous speech, and again, struggling to communicate subjective experiences to others. Those could all be emotional warning signs. So a few reminders. Um, a lot of times kids who've been through trauma are missing the content of what you're saying, whether it's in class or if you're having that private conversation with them because they're taking the time to read your face. And if they're reading anger, disapproval, something like that in your face, that's what they're hearing. That's what they're absorbing, not what you're saying. So being mindful of like if the last class was terrible and the class where this kid that gets you every day is, is uh, that class begins, be mindful of your, of your demeanor when you approach this next class. Because sometimes, even though we, uh, we say we start fresh, we got to have that pleasant face with our kids. Um, 
misattributing negativity and nonverbal communication of adults and peers. Um, and the trauma book here says, many children who are pulled out of abusive situations, which we have the group homes and all that kind of stuff, um, and placed in the care of loving families don't adjust well. Just because they're in a new situation doesn't mean they're all of a sudden going to be able to adjust. There's a lifetime of things that are going on. And the reason for this is their brains are told normal is this over here. And if they're living in a loving home, there's, there's an adjustment issue. And that's going to take some time. So one thing all the research mentioned was classroom climate is huge. Um, and actually, John Hattie mentions that. And when he talks about some of the highest effect sizes of things you can do in your classroom, um, one of the highest ones is, is, is uh, teacher-student relationships. I mean, a lot of it goes to this type of thing. Um, emphasizing supports that help kids manage stress, stress and avoid trauma triggers, teaching them how to manage stress because no one has taught them that before. The self-talk, again. Helping these kids build positive relationships with teachers and peers, that actually has to be explicitly taught to them. Um, help children being to be open to learning. We're going to talk about growth versus fixed mindset in a minute. This, that's one way to do it. Um, positive interactions with teachers can change a child's expectations of relationships and give them security. Uh, we may be the only functional adult that they're around. And that's why it's so huge, even though it's challenging and even though it's hard, to consistently be that positive adult in that child's life, even when you're frustrated, because that can make a difference. It really can. Um, teachers need to establish themselves as a source of comfort and a secure base for exploration and learning, meaning I'm allowed to fail in here, and I'm allowed to try and fail, and I'm going to be safe. I'm not going to be slapped, yelled at, any of these other things. It's going to be a safe place. My teacher is going to be okay with me doing that. Um, and the relationship that needs to be created is one that balances support and opportunity. Some good teaching strategies. These are just good teaching strategies, but this is, these were specifically identified as good for kids with trauma, is reinforcing core concepts. That's why when we have the LOs and the, CL, the, LOs and the COs and we train in PSYOP that you go back and you touch on LOs and COs throughout the lesson, that's reinforcing core concepts. That's something that's good for these kids. They're being reminded of, this is why I'm doing this. Scaffolding new information on prior knowledge. Um, using purposeful classroom discussion to help them practice articulating their thoughts. Um, providing direct instruction on how to collaborate with peers. We usually provide direct instruction on the, uh, the activity, but not direct instruction on what it looks like to collaborate. Like who takes turns? What does turn taking look like? And what does it look like if you disagree with your person, with the person in your group? Um, those type things need to be directly taught. Asking students to set a personal goal that they hope to achieve by the end of the activity, not just a big goal for the quarter or something like that, but like, hey, for this activity, I want to see if you can write down three. Something like that, showing that you can meet these goals. Um, holding them to high expectations while providing the necessary scaffolds to guarantee success using multi-sensory instruction more than traditional lecture. And again, the reason why is because multi-sensory connects both sides of the brain. It really does, versus just sit and get. <clears throat> Giving students frequent opportunities to do something with what they're learning. You're teaching the brain to talk. <laughs> Having students talk about a concept with a peer, complete a hands-on activity, draw a picture symbolizing what they've learned. Ongoing formative assessment helps them acquire self-awareness. So, um, you know, we, we get frustrated with CFAs and like DT4L and all that stuff, but the ongoing form of assessment lets them see, I am making progress. I can see, here was my action and here is the result. And if you're interested in how to do um, formative assessments within class periods multiple times, I have some resources in my office. There's one I read over the summer that was really good to, to really help them see self-awareness. Differentiated instruction. Uh, frequent opportunities to give and receive feedback, integrating music, movement, and deep breathing, and then act, and you as the teacher talking aloud about how you would solve the problem or overcome the obstacle. Actually speaking your uh, what you would do first, second, third, and fourth so that they can hear that. With classroom management, uh, a lot of times, Traumatized children, they experience events as random 
um, as uncontrollable and as unrelated to what occurred in the past. So, like, if you have a kid and you're like, the reason why you have this consequence is you did this, 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 and this, which led to this. Well, that may not compute as easily for a traumatized kid because they're not seeing, oh, my choice here and my choice here and my choice here led to this consequence. A lot of times, um, I, this is somewhere in there. I'm just going to say it now. This is what gets me. A lot of times, uh, punishments and rewards are given out by parents as a result of how the parent feels versus as a result of what that child does. So a lot of times a child will see a consequence as, well, you gave that to me because you don't like me. They're not seeing it as, oh, because I did this, 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 and this, and this, and here's the consequence. Because their caregiver, it's, it's, it's all has to do with the mood of the day as to whether or not they get a reward or punishment a lot of times. Uh, they live in the moment. They find it very difficult to project a future where they can control what happens to them. That's why a lot of times they'll shut down. That's why a lot of times they talk about college or dreams of one day, what, what do you want to do? They don't live in that world. That's a new concept for them. Um, our, it's really important with classroom management to articulate and review behavioral expectations with these kids. Um, safety, they feel safe when the, when the routine is predictable, when there's calendars, when there's charts, when there's visual timers that signal to them you have this much amount of time before something's supposed to be done. Uh, Firm and respectful boundaries are huge. You want to demonstrate kindness and helpful behaviors towards others and teach them how to manage conflict. Um, and I will say, as far as classroom climate and the feeling of safety, if you guys are interested, I worked with my friend who is a counselor at a rehab facility um, nearby. And uh, I was talking about, a lot of times we have situations where there's an escalating behavior. But if you give points, it just makes it worse, right? And I'm not talking about something you necessarily have to refer to the office. We've got to refer things to the office when it gets bad. But like just something escalating in the class where you know they'll blow up if, if you give that consequence. There's a form I have, and I, I have multiple versions of it called a refocus form, where um, I used to have a desk in the back of my classroom with a stack of these forms. And I would say, do you need a minute to refocus? And sometimes that would be if a behavior is escalating. Sometimes that would be if they came in and I could just read on their face something's up. And they would say yes or no. And they would go to the back and they would start filling out the form. And the form just asked identifying questions of what happened. Like, what were you feeling at the time that this happened? Sometimes it was like a in the hall between two peers that they're brain, they just can't focus. So what was going on? What was happening right before? What did you do? What was the consequence of what you did? Were you hungry? Were you tired? where you, you know, there's something called halt. I forget what each one stood for, but were any of these things going on? And actually on the back I had a feelings wheel. What feeling were you feeling when this occurred? And then if it was something escalating in the classroom, I had something at the bottom that said, I do understand that if this happens again, I lose points. But it was just a different intervention that, you, that we tried um, to help kids kind of process what was going on and get ready to go back to the classroom setting. Raider, it's almost time. Uh, you guys have lunch uh, starting at 11.30. Uh, if you need to leave after lunch to make your way to the, uh, the service that starts at 2 p.m. at um, Cedar Road Baptist, please feel free to do that. Again, you guys are out for lunch now. If you need to leave early uh, to head to the service, that is perfectly appropriate. You guys have a great lunch. Okay, I think we started five minutes after time. So if I, I don't know how to use my new watch yet. I'm just watch the clock. Five minutes. We're wrapping up. Someone can can you you have a clock in front of you? Tell me. I would tell Siri, but it takes too long. <laughs> classroom. Um, other things of classroom management. Uh, handle infractions in a way that increases their self awareness. So when you do have to take a point, when you do have to write a kid up, talk about self awareness and their ability to monitor their behaviors. Te use that as a teaching opportunity to help them be self aware. Um, remember, this is it right here. Erratic relationships with caregivers have taught them that rewards and punishments are more a function of the adult's mood than their own behavior. That's why it sometimes doesn't work, because this is what they believe. I think that's huge. Physical proximity, using a loud voice, activates sensory reactions that do associate with traumatic memories. That's why I don't yell at the kids, don't stand over them to be intimidating, stuff like that. 
Um, criticism or perceived disapproval produces feelings of shame. An authoritarian attitude or unfair consequence sparks anger, anger or rage. Um, and I do want to point out, and the book mentions this, please be aware of yourself. Um, compassion fatigue is real. Secondary trauma is a real thing, too. When, you're, when you've been working with kids who've been through this stuff for a while, all the therapists at Wellspring go to counselors and therapists themselves because you need to develop some self-care for your own self when we're experience a lot of, experiencing a lot of this. And um, mindfulness, mindful awareness of your own, of your own self, when, like knowing when you get frustrated, knowing where your triggers are, what will set you off with a kid, and being mindful of that, remembering that these kids are not always in a healthy place is so important. So last thing I want to end with is our strength-based strategies. So this is, again, what I learned from Wellspring when I went to their training. All of their therapists use this. Um, the, the girls live there, and uh, the choice is either live in this facility or go to jail. So there's not an option to, like, remove them. If they are removed, they go to jail. So that's, like, kind of what the court appointed thing is. So they have to handle situations and de-escalate versus, like, all right, then last time and you're out. So this is what uh, the training says. Get to know the student's whole person, not just what they do academically is huge. Find their strengths in other places. Ask students, what was, the, what was successful the last time you did well? Think back to a time when you know you did a good job. What was going on when that happened? Help them identify that moment and what they did to contribute to something going well. Honor a student's strengths to get by and pay attention to what they're doing well. When encountering a problem, use their strengths to address it. So where I've seen that is like uh, they were giving, at this training they were giving an example of a girl that like cussed out her therapist or cussed out the person living with them. And uh, the way that they had to handle it, and of course this is a therapeutic setting, not a school, but they were just like, they would talk to the girl. They said, wow, I see that you are, you have a strength in knowing your own mind knowing what you think. A lot of people cannot articulate what they think, but you can. That's a really good strength of yours. I would like to use that strength to do X, Y, and Z over here. Um, instead of telling students what to do, ask them questions to help them discover it for themselves. Remember that a student's complaint often shows what they value. So if they're complaining a lot about something or about a kid, it might be like, wow, I'm hearing you complain about this. That tells me you're really valuing loyalty. Loyalty is really important to you. Or, wow, that means you really value, um, you know, genuineness, someone who's, who's the same to your face and someone who's the same away from your face. I really, that's a great value to have, and I'm seeing this as a strength of yours. Um, tap into where students are experts. Look for that. When looking at a problem behavior, consider whether or not it is a lack of skill set or a lack of motivation. Is it a skill issue and you just need to build skill set, or is it a will issue and their will driver is not being, um, there's something up with their will. So you want to figure out what's their currency. Remember that a student who resists authority, of course, might do so because they're reminded of an abuser who was in authority. Make compliments to reinforce good behavior. Uh, like this, I noticed that several times in class you could have had the opportunity to talk, but you didn't. I appreciate that. Or like if they didn't talk for the first five minutes, maybe they were great during weird time, but the rest of the class they were terrible because you did all these really engaging activities and they were all over the place. You could, instead of saying like, wow, you could not shut your mouth for most of the period, you could say, you were quiet the whole weird time. Whoa. I am impressed. Do you realize you were able to go the full seven minutes? And I know it was seven minutes because I had a timer. You were able to go that full time and keep your mouth shut? Way to go, man. I want to see if you can do 15 tomorrow. Something like that to show, like, you were able to do it. You're not hopeless. Thank you. Look for, um, uh, if a student does make a mistake, notice, a mistake, notice how long it took them to make that mistake. Consider what skill they had to use to hold off and focus on that skill. Look for exceptions because no problem occurs all of the time. Um, know the difference between encouragement and praise. Praising is a judgment call on who that child is. Encouragement is uh, talking about a skill that they used and encouraging them to do it again. 
So encouragement involves noticing, whereas praise sets a bar and said, you reached this bar, you did not reach this bar. Um, encouragement focuses on their effort. Uh, the, you can, they say, talk about the concept of practicing to encourage the correct behavior. I want you to practice keeping, keeping still for this amount of time. Let's practice that versus you can't do it. There's no way you can keep still for this amount. Of, you, you just failed at that. I want to see if you can practice the right thing. Uh, there's a whole ton of research on growth and fixed mindset. This is really good stuff if you ever want to look into it. That's it. And I do want to end with this. Uh, this is a note I keep taped to my desk that I got when I was a teacher from a girl who I definitely know went through trauma because we knew her background. It's just a reminder that this, these kids are in our classrooms. This is our why. Because you might be the only teacher... You might be the only adult that sees past the presenting behaviors to who that child really is. So I leave you with that. Um, Teasley folks, on the note-taking guide on the back, there were several opportunities for coaching. If you're interested in that, um, on, if you want to go further, look at some books or look at some particular kids. I do have a feedback form as well um, for what you need. And that, for you guys from other schools, that form is really targeted towards them because I'm a coach, so I'll go back in and work with them. But I'd love to get your thoughts as well on the presentation. But I know it's five minutes over, a little bit more, so seven minutes. So we're good.